All right. We are doing our first live stream since hitting 6,000 subscribers. So this is exciting. I'm so grateful that I can do this, uh, answer any sort of violin questions, but I'm also going to uh, wait for some people to come in, join the chat, and maybe get started from there. So if right now I have the microphone just above me, let me know if anyone can hear me. I'm going to try to tap it that way. <laughs> All right. Oh, looks like my camera kind of fell. Okay. Yeah. I'm just going to wait for some people. I'm going to maybe tune my violin in the meantime. Adeo, hello, good evening to you. I hope all is well with you. And um, yeah, so anyone who's joining in, please feel free to ask a violin question in the chat. I am here for you guys. I really like uh, doing these live streams last time, and I'm just gonna kind of just dive right into any questions that you may have. So let me know if the if the audio here is not so good, but anyways, let me just blow my nose real quick. Okay. That's the thing about live streams that you kind of can't predict <laughs> any of those things. So question one, Adeo. So what shoulder rest do you use and what violin do you have? So currently I've been revisiting the Kuhn Bravo. It is a wooden shoulder rest by Kuhn. It looks something like this. And I use this um, because it's really comfortable on my shoulder. It is kind of on the heavier side. It's kind of different than what I have used in the past year, which is this um, this ultralight shoulder rest. This one is very light, and I kind of like it for various reasons, but I also don't like it for other couple reasons. But I've been revisiting the Kuhn Bravo because I've been using it for orchestra performances. So I like to just have that comfort and the way I, the way it looks on my violin, let me put it on for you is just so, just so that you get a sense of what it looks like, kind of looks like this. And when I put the violin up, that is kind of how it looks on my, on my violin. This is what it looks like on the back. And, you know, there are different schools of thought and different comfort levels. Sometimes people kind of put their shoulder rest all the way back and they really try to feel the connection between their collarbone and their shoulder. But I like recently, I've been kind of like experimenting with it again just to see what fits and what doesn't fit. And what kind of violin do I have? I have a Jan Pawlikowski violin made in 2015. And this is a Polish violin that I just adore. I love it for chamber music. I love it for recital playing. It has really helped me a lot. And the strings that I have on are currently the Tomasic Infeld dynamo strings those are the new strings that dynamo has released i have the pleasure of trying them on and i find them to be really comfortable on my instrument when it comes to playing on the left hand and also just the sound quality the overtones are really rich on my instrument so that's what i love um uh, i love to play on these and then yeah so in terms of the strings it really is a personal thing i you might have seen my video today that I released at 8 a.m. Eastern on the YouTube channel. And when it comes to improving your sound within 10 minutes, I talk about strings and how strings can have an important, uh, can be an important thing for your instrument. However, the strings that work for me don't necessarily work for every instrument, you know? And that's something that I've talked to the product manager of Tomasic Infeld, that each string is designed for something completely different, for different wants and different needs. Dominant pros are used for a very specific cause. Dy uh, dynamos are different. Dominants are different. So I always recommend that if you're experimenting with strings, talk to your luthier if you have a new instrument. Talk to a luthier that you trust to see what kind of string tension would be applicable to your violin. In this case, this is kind of a higher tension string, around 49 to 50 kilograms for all four strings. And it happens to work really nicely. The do dominant pros tend to be on a little bit lesser tension, but it it kind of goes hand in hand. The dominant pros are more balanced, while the dynamo, they have a lot of projective and overtones. So that's something that I 
uh, really appreciated when I'm doing, um, when I'm playing on these strings. And then have I ever used gut strings? Uh, you know, I have used gut strings. I've used a tricolor, uh, tricolor or tricolor strings that Heifetz used to use. And pe some people say that those are not actually the the actual strings that Heifetz use. And to be honest, I would like to, I love to revisit those strings again because I bought those strings as a full set as laminated or you know it's because you can have the regular gut and then the laminated gut i i did the laminated one but in this case i think i might want to revisit that for the non-laminated one and then um for uh, viola what is your opinion of the viola have you ever played it before i have played viola uh, it is not my primary instrument because i i kind of cater towards a violin but i think every violin should have a knowledge of viola. I was grateful to know uh, a violin professor, my professor back in my undergraduate degree in music. He played both violin and viola. And it was always kind of really interesting to see how viola students performed during our studio classes because I got to use a little bit of that knowledge and apply it in my violin playing, which actually, which is something that I encourage you to look at in my recent video when it comes to having a better sound in 10 minutes, I actually use a specific viol violin and viola technique to help improve your sound. So I really recommend that you do that. And of course, the viola is, as you know, there are so many viola jokes out there, but I have a lot of colleagues who play viola and are wonderful violists. And if you are always, if you are ever interested in maybe helping improve your sound, playing viola may not be such a bad idea and some benefits to that you are using a lot more weight. You are probably going to like have an entire, you're going to have entire access to like a whole new repertoire. Uh, you can play stuff from clarinet. You can play like the Bach cello suites, which are just amazingly beautiful. And that's, if I were to like go to the viola dark side, then I would just, I would just play Bach cello suites all day, every day. So that's kind of like the one thing with uh, viola, that I like to do. And uh, do I enjoy dissonance? I find that it is kind of relaxing and kind of cleanses my mind or ears for a bit. Hmm. I never really thought about it that way because dissonance is supposed to actually achieve the opposite. It's supposed to kind of have a juxtaposition of actual tonal harmony. So having something that's maybe atonal is may not be so pleasant to the ear but if, if if it relaxes you great that all by all means that's what makes music so great is that everything is so subjective with um with atonality versus tonality and dissonance dissonance for me like a, a good example of dissonance is <clears throat> the introduction of mozart's dissonance quartet you know quotes dissonance quartet he never really called it dissonance but it was one of those master class examples where mozart really was Kind of ahead of his time he really used harmony in such a unique and specific way and used like that introduction of the distance quartet is like a prime example of just having that tension i think to me dissonance is tension because dissonance towards tonality like in harmony structure you're trying to go towards the tonic you're trying to go towards just pleasing the ear and yeah, at least that's for me. But, you know, to each their own. I think dissonance is, you know, a wonderful compositional tool. I think that we use it all the time. Uh, but, yeah. Yeah, there it is. But have you ever used your violin for religious or spiritual reasons in your own life? Uh, yeah. I mean, you know, as a, as a practicing Christian, I, I use my violin to play in various sermons. Not sermons, but in various church services. So I'm, I'm really happy to talk about that experience but for me i like um yeah that's that's something that i like to do is kind of like show my appreciation to give thanks with my instrument and because i know a lot of people out there don't never have the kind of, kind of education that i've had and it's always just like giving back to the world giving the giving the world more music in whether it's in a concert hall whether it's in the subway whether it's in the church service that is always my goal, just trying to kind of create, uh, trying to bring people into the whole musical uh, experience for me. Uh, 
Okay, so I got a comment from Joseph. Three weeks, we'll be hitting the two year mark of playing the violin. Yes, Joseph, good for you, buddy. I'm, I'm excited for you. Uh, type in what, how your experience has been and what piece you're working on. I'm curious to know and if you need any help with anything. I, I love to kind of chime in on that. Um, Halil, do you have any violin chord tutorials such as Udemy or else? Um, actually, I'm glad you mentioned that because I do have a violin vibrato course that I have on my violin podcast online school. And if I specifically put that in the description, YouTube description below, so that way you can click on it and you can kind of get a preview of the first course, um, not the first course, but the first lesson of that course. So can you get a sense of what that may look like? So I love talking about vibrato. Uh, vibrato has been actually a struggle of mine, you know, growing up. So I figured that the first most meaningful course that I wanted to do is to talk about vibrato because I kind of have my own sense of how I should do vibrato, but I also kind of want to share my knowledge to a lot of other people. But stay tuned because I'm actually thinking about, not thinking about, there are other violin courses in the works uh, for the holiday season. So be sure to subscribe to the violin YouTube channel. Be sure to subscribe to the mailing list that I have. And I don't spam the emails. Actually, I'm the one that writes out all the emails and I'm the one that posts all the video content and whatever like is new in my violin career. And usually at minimum, it it's like once, once a week, once a month. I mean, I've kind of been pretty bad about it because a lot of things have happened in my life. I performed um, kind of an extensive performance schedule recently. So I've been trying to get back into that before the holiday season. But yes, so the violin course, the violin vibrato course is actually available now. And you're, you're happy to kind of take a look at that and would love your feedback. So uh, I know that we have four people for people and two likes in this live stream. So thank you to all who are here. And again, would love to play. Um, okay, we actually, we have another question here. Started college and a friend is trying to convince me to join the local firm on it, but I feel like I physically cannot handle the emotional weight of the music after experience a lot of chamber music in high school. Any advice? Huh, interesting. So I would say, um, you cannot physically handle the emotional weight of the music after experience a lot of chamber music in high school. Um, that's a, that's a quite a unique situation. I guess it depends on what kind of music you're playing. I know that there are some pieces of music and some composers and music history are, um, uh, like I know that some some people have their opinions about Wagner and some people have their opinions about Brahms and everybody has, their own way of dealing with that type of music because of the composers like history and their ideologies. I can, I can see how that could be really emotional. Like I know that recently I performed with uh, Yo-Yo Ma in New Hampshire. You know, I, I wasn't performing alongside him, but I was in the second violin orchestra, uh, second violin and the orchestra. And, you know, that for me was quite an emotional experience because he was talking about how, Elgar, that was like the last piece he wrote in his life. And he was trying to connect um, nature into what he was performing um, into the Elgar. And he's been performing this concerto for like 50 years. So he's like, he's conditioned to do that. So uh, I think, you know, after coming out of that experience, coming out of that performance, I definitely did feel like an emotional response because for one, performing with the great Yo-Yo Ma, that was amazing. And his his playing is just really amazing even to this day. So it, it, I think that's something to just try to figure out. I think every concert makes you so emotional and you cannot handle that again. I guess um, it, it, it depends on what kind of music, as I said, it does depend on what kind of music you're performing. Like if you're performing something that is maybe politically charged or if you're maybe playing something that has a lot of meaning in your life and you come out of the performance just not being able to handle that then i can understand that but i think but ultimately to answer your question you know you can do what you feel comfortable with you know you have every right to join and you have every right not to join and if it feels like this 
you can always give it a try. Try to join the local Philharmonic. And if it does create some kind of um, like negative feeling in, in yourself, then obviously don't do that. We want you to have really good emotional well-being while playing music. That's the whole point. However, music does have such significant power and impact on our bodies and our minds. So you definitely want to take care of that. You know, your psychology and your spirit and your mind really definitely come first. Um, okay, so Joseph writes, progressing pretty well, still playing in first position, currently working on first handles a la Hornpipe from Water Suite, Misty Mountains from the Hobbit movie, and what level do you recommend starting to learn vibrato? First of all, great. I'm so glad that you're playing Handel's handle water music. Really fun stuff. And vibrato, can you can start learning vibrato when you have mastered the ability to play in first position first position and third position and the reason why i say first and third is because you want to have stable intonation before you even approach vibrato i'm actually working with a an adult student in his 70s who loves to vibrate he loves vibrato however i kind of slightly encourage him to maybe focus on learning the music in its purest form without any vibrato, just so that we get the good intonation down. I think good intonation is really helpful uh, to just establish a nice vibrato. So if I'm playing, let's say, I don't know, Be Natural, for instance, and let me know in the comment section or in the, in the chat that you can't hear me. Um, I, have a, I have a microphone here, but if I'm playing a, a Be Natural, I'm playing this Be Natural here, and then all of a sudden, you want to have that that center core pitch established before you even play. Because a lot of students, what they don't know is that the vibrato needs to go downward, not upward. Because if I play a vibrato and I do the oscillation above the desired pitch, you can see that the ear interprets the top of the oscillation of the, of the vibrato. So by allowing you to have a good established intonation will definitely help you achieve that. And the way to practice that, of course, when, whenever you feel ready is just doing slow motions. I believe that if you, if you learn slow, you forget slow. So you definitely want to take your time. You don't want to learn this poorly. So if you're playing, um, you know, F sharp in third position, You do all sorts of different oscillations. You can do one, you know, one oscillation per bow. Then you do two notes per bow. Then triplet. Then four notes. Then six. And then you kind of go up from there, and you get you get the idea. So you you work your way through that, and then you can do this with a metronome. I mean, that's probably the most preferred way if you practice vibrato with a metronome i always teach that with my students and i also teach that in my violin vibrato course and i kind of go into detail as to how to really achieve that so i hope that helps and um yeah yeah so work work on work on that with vibrato i mean it's always great to experiment you just don't want to like press too much because if i if i press too much in first position let's say i play be natural right and i press a little harder you may notice that the pitch kind of went up a little bit. And then in addition to that, my hand is going to feel 10. And the overall intonation is going to be just, just sharp. And you don't want that. You want to have, again, just really make sure that you have a, a consistent intonation and tempo. So uh, for all of those... For to those who are joining us for the live stream, thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate it. And we're kind of celebrating unintentionally the 6,000 subscriber mark that we just hit. So that's really awesome. Thank you for all your support and all of what you've done to help grow this channel and to be a part of this community. I try to make it so that everybody can get their questions answered when their teachers are not around or you kind of gain a different perspective on learning the violin. and that's part of my job. I just want to make sure that I kind of share the violin with everybody. So just give me one moment. I need to blow my nose real quick. So I'm curious to know where people are coming from, where people are watching and tuning in from. I, I'm uh, interested where Halil is coming from, Joseph, 
Adeo. I'm curious where you guys are watching from. Where I where I'm based right now, I'm based in Boston, and we have this beautiful New England foliage. And this is my favorite time of the year. October is actually one of those months where I have a lot of happy memories, and I have uh, wonderful memories of the foliage. The colors are changing; is just it's it's beautiful. Central Arkansas, Joseph. I've never been to Arkansas. If you recommend recommend anywhere to go in Arkansas, I would love to uh, make a trip down there. Um, Turkey, wonderful uh, Turkey. Um, I wonder if you are in Istanbul. I have a close friend who is from Turkey, from Istanbul, who's a wonderful violinist, and she's just amazing. Uh, Montreal, John, I love Montreal. Um, the poutine you guys have in Montreal is just delicious. It's really good. I'm I'm actually kind of a foodie. Uh, my wife turned me into a foodie. So, um, but we also have New Mexico. Hey, that's not bad. New Mexico. I've you know I have to say I've never traveled through New Mexico, but I've heard good things. I know a great cellist out in New Mexico who I performed the Shostakovich Second Piano Trio, and great great people in new mexico and i'm you know i can't wait to actually spend some actual meaningful time there i haven't i haven't just had a chance to go there as far west i've been to california but never got to go down newport oh great i love newport i, I perform in newport all the time actually and uh, i play a lot of wedding events down in newport and yeah i i know I know a lot of, I've played at a lot of those hotels in Newport. So I'm pretty, um, I'm pretty well versed in the Newport downtown area and like, uh, like hotel Viking and a lot of those places. Those are great. Um, uh, okay. So New Mexico, Albuquerque, largest city, very turned very dangerous. Beware. Okay. I definitely will be careful when I visit down in New Mexico, but I also actually have a colleague uh, from New Mexico who plays viola, actually. He's a great violist. He's based in Boston now, and I actually went to school with him, and he that's that's one of my other connections to New Mexico. But going back to Newport, I'm, I'm curious to know if you have any good places to eat, Skylark, in Newport, because I'm sometimes down there for uh, for to perform events or whatever, like private events, and I'm always looking for recommendations on where to go down there in Newport. Like I've played on, where did I play? Um, like Goat Island, uh, like maybe south of that Block Island. Uh, Brady. Oh, good to, good to me. Good to see you, Brady. Oh, pe okay. Pedro Salado. Is that, I, is that a, is that a Mexican restaurant? If you like Mexican. Okay, good. Mexican. So uh, have you ever met any music from New Mexico State University? I know a few violas from here and surrounding areas. Uh, no, unfortunately, I don't know any uh, musician from that university. But I'll make sure to make I'll make sure to go down there for a specific uh, for a specific time. I know that there are some music festivals down in New Mexico that like chamber music chamber music festivals in Albuquerque. I heard that they're pretty good. So um, in about 15 seconds, we're gonna we're just gonna take a little break and then come back with some extra violin questions and we'll be right back. Do I go to Emerson? No, but I do see, I do know people who went to Emerson and Emerson is a great, uh, great school, good film school from what I, from what I know and from what I hear. And usually people that go to Emerson, they do film and then they, uh, they go out West to LA or California. So Northwest Arkansas during the fall mountains and beautiful fall avoid summer, extremely hot and humid. Noted, definitely will not visit Arkansas in the summer. <laughs> that's that's great. You know, when now that Skylar kind of introduced a whole food with like Mexican, I've always kind of combined the idea of different taste palettes with food and 
in, into music. I've always felt that the different colors that you can do with violin, you can kind of, it's very similar to food or like, like the different kinds of cuisines. Um, one, one little blurb for WC violin sonata that I can think of right now has this really different kind of color, different taste of uh, the palette. Yeah, so like that's like a different taste versus like a Brahms, you know, Brahms second sonata. Something that's more rich and more thick in the sound and the texture. And there are so many different composers out there that have a very specific sound. What what is your poutine? sound <laughs> oh man i've never even thought of that john um i'm trying to think because poutine you have the fries and then you have the gravy on top of the fries i'm trying to th i'm trying to think of like violinistic elements to incorporate into the poutine uh hmm. well definitely the gravy has got to be something smooth something that's silky right so like so something legato but what if I added something like with the left hand too? What if I did? Um, I'm trying. I'm trying to think. Let me. So yeah, or cheese. Yes, pardon me. Cheese melting, not not gravy, but cheese melting. Hmm. Huh. If there's if there's a piece that tasted like poutine, what would that be? Well, I'm thinking that poutine is like a a fun food, so I'm I'm thinking that. Um, oh, maybe I can do like Mozart Rondo. I feel like it's kind of perky. I mean, it does not legato bow. I think that's kind of fun. Dude, those fries are definitely G-string. <laughs> okay, fine. All right. What if I did... Um, I mean, it definitely wouldn't be flat of the bumblebee. Like I, I, I don't. My fingers are so cold that I can't even play flat, flat of the bumblebee. But what if it's flat of the bumblebee, folks? With the, with that. Um, yeah. But how about this? And maybe in a future video, in a future live stream, come back and maybe I, I will, I'll give that some serious thought about the, about the poutine and the cheese. <laughs> Um, Jose comes in and writes your posture video two weeks ago. Helped me so much. Thanks. Have you tried play without a shoulder rest? Uh, first of all, thanks. I'm so glad that the video has helped you. And have I, of course, I've tried to play without a shoulder rest. And at times, if I feel that there's some, something not working with my violin technique, I actually resort away from the shoulder rest. I take the shoulders off and I try to fig figure out what kind of what, what kind of problem that I do, um, I try to figure out some kind of problems without the shoulder rest, right? So I, I kind of like to use the most, the most organic way of playing violin to see what I'm doing wrong. Is it my left hand? Is it my posture? Is it, um, yeah. So let's say like, I've been really into uh, Morgan by Richard Strauss and for me, when it, it's such a simple melody, like ascending melody, but when I play it, I try to play without a uh, shoulder rest. I try to play without a shoulder so that way I can I can really feel what I'm doing wrong. If I'm slouching, am I, am I, is my posture correct? And then, and then I put my shoulders on once I've established what I needed to do. Uh, just to kind of see if I'm if I'm behaving differently with my left shoulder, for instance. I know that sometimes and most times I, I'm guilty of this where I, I lift my left shoulder off. That's why I do violin videos because sometimes I kind of realize what I'm doing wrong. And then I make these violin videos to help you guys out because I've, I've experienced it in my own violin practice. So... Yeah, I really suggest that if you're going to practice without a shoulder rest, really make sure that your fundamental fundamentals are absolutely secure. Like your posture is great. Your left hand is really consistent. 
across all positions from first to second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth above, and then really try to go from there. And, and then for me, the, the common issue with people playing without a shoulder rest is that they tend to squeeze the left hand a lot, especially the thumb. And believe it or not, that you are creating a lot of tension in your thumb and that travels up to your neck. So you want to, you want to be, you want to be careful when you do that, because if you play without a shoulders for a longer period of time, you could actually get injured and have some shoulder sh- surgeries. Something that's not often talked about is high fits. You know, Joshua high fits had multiple shoulder surgeries, but those were not public knowledge because, you know, he was a great Yasha Haifas. He was the one that played without a shoulder rest. So, and he was amazing at it, but anyhow, that that's my take on shoulder rest. Um, what is one of your favorite violin recordings, artist or piece? Ooh, that's tough. You know, I do have an answer to that, Brady. I do have an answer to that. One recording that w- when I was growing up, when I finally like started taking like classical recording seriously, was James Ennis's recording of the Korngold Violin Concerto. For some reason, when I was listening to that for the first time, it's just like this entirely new world of cinema and orchestral music kind of blended together. And I've always had an appreciation for cinematic music. And sometimes on the channel, I go ahead and maybe do like the, like my musical analysis of like the Mandalorian or, you know, right now I'm watching Loki season two, which the music is incredible. If anyone has seen the first episode of Loki season two, go do yourself a favor and really take a look at what the composer is doing. The music is absolutely incredible. It is so good. And yeah, but James Ennis's recording of the Korngol Violin Concerto was not only clean, but James Ennis was, is one of my favorite violinists, um, right? You know, in the performance circuit, I hope to have him on the violin podcast at one point when he spares a minute for, uh, for the podcast. I would, you know, one day hope to do that for you guys, but yeah, that was, that's one of the recordings that come to mind. Um, another recording that I like a lot is Yulia Fisher's Bach violin concertos. Those are great when it comes to violin repertoire. But another another recording that I like is um, Pinka Zuckerman's recordings of Elgar in the introduction. I think something um, something that he does so well. Uh, like at the very end, he does a great job of just like blending all those, all those melodies together in the string section. I couldn't think of another orchestra or ensemble that did it as well as that Pink Zuckerman recording. So I really liked that. Uh, Dvorak's Violin Concerto. Yeah, that's a good one too, Brady. That's a good one. Uh, so Skylar recommends conductor Derek Gleason, Dublin Phil has beautiful soundtrack orchestral recordings on YouTube. Okay. I'll have to check that out. I, I like, I like re- discovering new recordings of, of, of that type of, did you happen to know like specifically what, what piece they were recording or do you like Skylark? Cause I'm curious to know, cause I, I am, you know, corn gold is one of those people. I don't know if you guys know the, um, the history behind Korngold Violin Concerto, but it wasn't originally supposed to be written for Heifetz. Heifetz actually premiered in St. Louis, and Eric Korngold was like the violin, was not the violin, but was the musical prodigy in Austria. And actually, Gustav Mahler was one of the people that gave significance to Eric Korngold, but because of the war breaking out in Eastern Europe, him and his family immigrated to the United States to escape the war. And he wanted to treat classical music seriously, but because he let, ended up in California, that's where, you know, Hollywood and cinema music really shined and flourished. So he he actually won Grammys um, in you know in the in the Academy. So he's known for he's known for having excellent music like King's Row. King's Row is a, is a classic score of his. Um, I don't know if that won a Grammy, but I think it it did pretty well. So, uh, 
soundtrack for Adam's Sons. Okay, yeah, I'll definitely write that down because I'm I'm, I'm looking for some some good music to listen to. Adam's Sons. Cool. Well, if nobody else has uh, violin questions, I know that this is it was kind of like a, a, a very unique time Sunday evening uh, live stream. But I figured that I wanted to try a different time. What uh, what time and day do you guys want me to do live streams? Because I I'm I'm here for you guys. I want to make sure that there are enough people to come watch these. Like I know that I just did a I'm doing it on a Sunday uh, evening, but I know that Saturdays may may be good or maybe Friday mornings. Um, but yeah, and. If you guys are, have any questions whatsoever, uh, reach out to me personally on my website, ericmogal.com, and send me a message through the website portal or through the contact page if you have any specific questions, comments, or concerns. Um, I, I'm here for you guys. And it seems like people people do something. People like the content on the channel. So after 6,000 subscribers, you know, when I first started the YouTube channel, I was really... I was really nervous starting this YouTube channel because I'm naturally an introvert and I was like, I was so bad on screen. I'm so terrible in front of a camera, but now that I've gotten used to it, like I'm talking in my YouTube studio, you know, where I do my violin tutorials and I've, I've gotten to like it. And hopefully that this kind of continues as to like a full-time career into uh, not so much a passion side hobby, but actually a full-time career career where i can actually spend time with you guys and you know answer more questions make a bigger impact in the violent world and violent community and uh looks like skylock has one more question do you ever have problems with your d-string issues on e and f sharp notes uh typically i don't but i can imagine that maybe the string tension may not be good on your violin try and try that maybe i was actually talking to, on in today's video that was released earlier this morning that sometimes like low tension strings can sound a little fuzzy or they can have like maybe your violin may have a wolf which if your violin does have a wolf then that's something to kind of go to a luthier and get that checked out sometimes f sharp especially on the g string f sharps on the g string sometimes have a wolf it's kind of a very awkward note especially on violin and that's why these strads, Guarneri's, Amati's, uh, Viomes, they have no wolves and they're just amazingly beautiful sounding instruments and they don't have any limitations when it comes to that. So it could be like an equipment issue. It could be a string issue, but something that I've learned in the past in, in my violin playing that maybe it could be like the height of the bridge. The bridge may not be may not be good but or also could be the string or the way you are pressing down on the finger it could be a whole variety of reasons i would have to kind of diagnose that like in a, in a lesson uh with you and uh yeah john i do have a podcast it's called the violin podcast uh violinpodcast.com you can listen to various interviews that i've done with some really amazing violinists right now i'm kind of on hi hiatus right now because i'm focusing on this channel but i am in the works of producing more content uh, on the violin podcast YouTube channel and on the violin podcast podcast, the audio format. So if you're interested, you can watch the actual interviews on the YouTube channel, violin podcast, very simple, and just go into the search engine and it'll just pop right up. And, um, uh, yeah, so it could be the fingerboard. Yeah, the fingerboard could be, maybe it could be too low, it could be too high, you know, it all depends. And sometimes the bridge, depending on how high the strings are, you never you never really know about that. Or it could be the nut. Yeah, the nut could actually, could, could be too high or too low. But uh, anyhow, friends, I got to get ready for the week ahead. And I appreciate all of you even though you know people are coming in and out i really appreciate you sticking around and yeah leave a I'm, i might do like a little little poll on the community board so just go to the community board on the different types of 
uh, different types of times that you want me to do these live streams. So that way, you know, whatever is most convenient for you guys. Um, uh, mind over finger podcast. Yeah. Renee. Yeah. John, my, uh, yeah. Mind over finger podcast. I actually had her on the violin podcast. So if you're ever interested in, I think that's episode six or seven, episode seven, that was after Timothy Choi. So check that out. It's on Apple podcast, Google, YouTube. Um, I, I can't remember if it's on YouTube. I think it's on YouTube. Yeah. I think I posted it on YouTube, but anyways, I'm going to go. Thanks so much, guys. I hope I answer all your questions and I will see you in an upcoming video and live stream. Take care, guys.